is how do we actually give voice? What if folks could rate the quality of the government services they got? There might be a real shift in quality. Yeah. All of a sudden. yeah, and I suppose there's also probably opportunities for greater participation and contribution. Mm -hmm. in uh, hopefully, uh, ten minutes after, well, and twenty and minutes after we get in. Uh, roast chicken, yeah, roast potatoes, cabbage. So amazing, and you know, when you look at low-income communities across the country, is that they're really the best at knowing what the solutions are. And when you look at the history of poverty in America, or frankly, around the world. People don't tend to rise out of poverty because of government programs. That structure has to be there to help them. But there's a lot of ingenuity that goes on, right? So why not figure out how to amplify that ingenuity through letting people, for example, share their experiences, what works for them, what's a good strategy, being able to search for opportunities. I mean, I think that there's so much that goes on in low-income communities that's actually not sort of quantified or written down or accessible to others. And even sharing knowledge across those communities could be very, very empowering. That's interesting. Back on what you said about big data and trying to assess the success of various government programs, what kind of extra inputs would be valuable that we can get now that we can get before? I think it's a question. A very, very good friend of mine, who, uh, Mauricio Lynn Miller, who won the MacArthur. Look at that, look, e cabs, look. All the taxis come back here. Crazy, huh? something called the family because it's their change over time a genius idea and yeah. really you know mauricio came from so the, uh, at this time of night anywhere in malta you can't get a taxi because from that company because they've all gone back there and <laughs> he said you know, crazy absolutely i'm going to get bonkers. all these programs out of the way of families and all i'm going to do is use data technology there is a better way to do that john are doing for but i can't be bothered to tell them and to allow them to communicate with each other look at the data the trouble is it involves more work for them each other so the well, people who run the company don't like put work families out on their own but give them the support do you like my new clock to be able to it's cool track, isn't it eh? that's live wallpaper track what's happening in the lives of their community and share what works so that that one in a hundred that you know figures out how to buy a house or get their kid into a great program becomes not an outlier but the standard and oh actually he's had tremendous impact i mean there have been huge gains in in frankly household income in his program home ownership has gone up by i think it's about 20 percent and students are doing better in school well guess what no government program at all now i happen to think that obviously it's a combination of the right supports of the government with the right information from families shared to other families. But that type of sharing that can be turbocharged through social media or other forms of data collection and technology, I think can really change the game in low-income communities across the United States. That's really interesting. That's like a, a much more productive version of the quantified self movement. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. much better than tracking your calories and your uh, steps. Or... Absolutely. And actually, one of the things that's interesting is hasn't really been applied yet. But I mean, exactly thinking about sort of the jawbone or the Fitbit and those types of things. You know, we do know what types of basic moves really help long term families. So, for example, reading to your child every day, huge difference in the number of vocabulary words children have going into school. And if they have those vocabulary words, how well they perform in school. You know, making sure you do your regular medical checkups, making sure that you have all your vaccines done. There are some very, very basic steps that actually can give huge boosts to childhood outcomes. And yet we don't actually have a way of tracking those. And so you could imagine a way, uh, maybe not wearing on your wrists, but you could imagine an app or a tracker that would help families, guide families through those types of things and say, look, have you done this? Have you done that? This is leads to boosts of 20% in child learning. You know, maybe you should try this. And then follows up with incentives to do that. Yeah, yeah, well, that makes sense. A lot of people, you know, even with better resources, are a little bit lost when they come home from the exactly. hospital. Exactly. Exactly. And actually, the Bezos Family Foundation, which, you know, is not Jeff Bezos is directly, it's his parents and his siblings, they have actually done some really, really interesting work around how to build apps that can help tell families what sort of activities should they be doing with their children, even from birth. So what should you do when you're, you know, diapering your child? You know, what are good songs to sing? How do you help increase their vocabulary? All those sorts of things. And I think you're right. Even high income. How do I help you, you increase your vocabulary, John? Me onto 
who are you working with? You seem to be very keen on this model. You know, I do. I help you every day by talking to you. Intelligent. We're just getting going, so I don't want to sort of announce things ahead of the time, but certainly we had some great support. Well, I thought you might have a view on it. We did with the Obama White House, and the uh, Chan Zuckerberg Initiative has really been at the forefront of a lot of the work, as well as Google and others. So I do think there's a lot of interest in pursuing this. Google happens to be doing some very, very interesting work now around the future of work and actually how to move folks along into the workforce more successfully. And we are working a little bit with them. We've been talking a lot to the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative about possibilities. So I do think there are a lot of openings. I think the issue for me, and this is uh, just more of a personal opinion on this, is I wanted to start this lab. When does your sister arrive? Um, because I wanted to go after some of the lowest. Which is when? And I see tons of possibilities, right? I mean, I sort of sit at home at night and think about the 10 things I'm that could sure, be tomorrow. Actually. I think it's, have a big yeah, but I it might be actually. Yeah. Those, are the, those are the programs we're pursuing right now. It is. Yeah. But I think that we really need a movement, not just in the Valley, but across the country, of how do we leverage this tech revolution for change. And what I was interested in doing in the lab was not only coming up with some case uses that I thought were very compelling and important, but in building a field around how do we take the best technology and adapt it to our biggest problems. The lab can do some interesting projects and you know maybe some of them will be real game changers, but nothing changes the world from one spot, right? Real shift is going to happen when we see people across the country sharing best practices, when we see companies across the country, not just in Silicon Valley, hey. how to apply these technologies, when Could we be. see investors yeah. flocking to do this, when we see government figuring out how to use technology and big data they might be to late be more for their team. And, yeah. and part of what we want to do is encourage <laughs> way beyond Possible in Malta, yeah. walls of they like donuts in Malta. is encourage the country to take up this charge seriously. Yeah. And what about long term? For example, Silicon Valley recently. You don't remember, but I used to have a an ex uh, paramedic motorbike, yeah, in Malta, in um, in France, yeah, and it still had uh, the lights on, so it didn't have the siren anymore, but I could put the lights on. Yeah. And also, because of the shape of the bike, it's like a police motorbike, yeah? A lot of the time, the uh, traffic would give way to you, you know? Because they would think you were police when you're there looking at the rear, rear view mirror, you know? Has shown how the American dream, how American mobility has dropped by 50% in the last 50 years, right? In the 1950s, 90% of children earn more than their parents and now it's dropped to lower than 50%. There is a real erosion of that mobility in the US and frankly, in Europe. People were thrilled that Le Pen didn't win the vote and were saying, oh, thank God, she only won 30% of the vote or whatever it was a third. I remember a decade before when her father won 10% of the vote in France in the presidential election and France was panicked. So there's been a real shift in the politics and you know we can, we can sort of say it's about racism and technology, frankly, you know, with these little bubbles where we're actually getting into these loops where people are reinforcing their own messages. And I think that's not helped. The reality is all those things play a huge part. But the other part is that opportunity is really being shut off for large swaths of the population. And therefore, that bubble has to burst because societies for long periods of time don't remain stable if you don't figure out how to readjust. Yes, and one of the favoured ideas in Silicon Valley at the moment for dealing with both the problems of stability and the problems of potential job losses to AI is universal basic income. What do you think of that? I think that some of the universal basic income conversations are really critical to have. I don't know if you know it, but this famous Niels Bohr quote, which is, Predictions are hard to make, especially about the future, <laughs> right? Well, part of the universal basic income obviously comes into what do you think the future is going to be? And there really is a debate right now as to whether or not we're looking at a future in which large swaths of the population are going to be unemployable 
or whether, you know, we're really just have to figure out how to adjust our education. And